me share with you today my favorite books about Jane Austen. And uh, I think that it might give you some reading suggestions. Uh, hopefully you will want to borrow from the Jazza Library, get hold of some of these fabulous books for yourself. This is one of the shelves in my lounge with my Jane Austen collection. So this whole bookcase is filled with Jane Austen books, uh, looking a little messy because things have been pulled out in order to prepare this talk. And I only thought of taking the photograph after I had pulled books out. But uh, this is just one of the Jane Austen collections that I have in my house. And uh, if, if ever there's a fire in this house, uh, these are the, some of the things that I will be rushing to save, armful after armful of Jane Austen books, because they mean so much to me. It has been said that Jane Austen is the third most written about woman of all time. Now, this was announced about 20 or so years ago in the New York Times, and I'm not quite sure how they worked it all out, but they came up with the conclusion that Jane Austen was the third most written about woman ever. Now, number one was Joan of Arc, and number two was the Virgin Mary. And as both of those women had the Catholic Church helping them every step of the way, I think Jane Austen has done incredibly well to get to position number three all by herself. So it is truly amazing. And of course, new books are appearing about Jane Austen all the time. And here, another picture of my collection on Jane Austen. I have over the years been an avid collector of books about Jane Austen, as well as different editions of the novels. I have been a keen shopper with the Jane Austen Bookshop in the United States, ordering books through them. Whenever I go into a secondhand bookshop, I go straight away to the Austen and the literary critical sections to see if they have copies that I have not yet owned. Of course, people have given me wonderful Jane Austen books over the years as gifts, and I have purchased books new in bookshops and online. So my Jane Austen collection really means an enormous amount to me, and I love it very dearly. Now, of course, I have added to the number of books on Jane Austen, so I have to really say that my very favourite books about Jane Austen are the ones that I have produced, because so much of myself and my time and my energy and enthusiasm for this novelist has gone <laughs> into the books that I have written. So all available from my website if anybody doesn't yet have a signed copy. Uh, let's begin with looking at biographies of Jane Austen. What uh, uh, biographies have I particularly enjoyed that tell us something about her life? Well, the very first sort of major biography, her, her brother Henry wrote a little biographical notice, but really the first proper biography was the one written by her nephew, James Edward Austen Lee, and it was published in the year 1869. Uh, it owed a lot to recollections of the various relatives. It is a very Victorian book. It's not my favourite biography, but I felt it was one that I had to mention. It very much gives the picture of dear Aunt Jane, who never said or, or did a nasty thing. You only need to read Jane Austen's letters to see that, yes, she did say nasty things sometimes. Uh, there's not a lot of private information in it. Uh, he, of course, was really protecting his aunt's name. Um, he states very firmly that she had no interest in fame, as if being interested in fame was somehow grasping and not ideal, and I don't think that's correct at all. I think she'd have especially loved all of the money that came with fame. Uh, it has been described as being a bit of a ragbag of a book, and I think that that's probably correct. However, what it did do was to generate a lot of interest in Jane Austen, and it did uh, get many people to turn to the novels and read them, and the popularity of Jane Austen's books greatly increased as a result of uh, this memoir. Now, following that one, there have been many, many, many others, and I have several on my shelves. Oh, that, by the way, is James Edward Austen Lee, looking very Victorian in that photograph. Uh, a great favourite of mine is a portrait of Jane Austen by David Cecil. There you can see Lord David Cecil. Uh, I actually met him once, or sort of, I, I stood near him, as perhaps the best I can say, 
when I attended a meeting of the Jane Austen Society in the UK, Lord David was there. He was standing on the lawn with his cup of tea and his cucumber sandwiches. I was a 20-year-old, 21-year-old from New Zealand. I'm not sure that I'd ever actually seen a lord before, so I sort of gazed at him with great interest because he was a lord, and also because he'd written this excellent book about Jane Austen and some other books that I had read. Uh, again, it's, it's perhaps a picture that shows Jane as being very gentle and sweet, uh, so perhaps not quite as realistic as it could be. But Lord David Cecil writes beautifully. It's got fabulous illustrations. And I think if you want a sort of short, pleasant biography of Jane Austen, then his one is a very good one to turn to. Uh, the next one that I read, and which for many years was considered, you know, pro probably the best biography of Jane Austen available, was the one by Park Honan, uh, an American scholar. This one was published in 1989. Park Honan died in the year 2014. Uh, it's a good authoritative uh, biography, perhaps not a particularly exciting or thrilling book to read in any way, but it is scholarly and he gets, you know, he gets his facts right. Uh, so it is a good biography to read. Uh, and until two other biographers came along, I think this probably was the, uh, the best uh, sort of full life of Jane Austen that people could get hold of. Then, uh, Claire Tomalin wrote her book in the year 1997, Jane Austen, A Life. Claire Tomalin is a fabulous biographer, one of my favorites of all time. She had, when she came to this book, already written a biography of Catherine Mansfield, Mary Wollstonecraft. She'd written about Charles Dickens and his mistress, Ellen Turnham. She'd written about the actress, Mrs. Jordan. She'd written about Shelley. So she, when she sat down to write Jane Austen, A Life, she was drawing on a real, you know, a massive amount of biographical skills already. She writes beautifully and elegantly. And uh, this book was very highly acclaimed. And I think in many, many circles is regarded as the finest biography that we have of Jane Austen. We were lucky enough, just after Jane Austen had written this book, uh, sorry, Claire Tomalin had written this book, to welcome her to a JASA meeting. We actually put on a special meeting because she was coming to Australia with her husband, or he might partner, I think he is. Uh, and I wrote to Claire and I said, you know, is there any possible chance you could come and give a talk to JASA? So she arrived at the JASA meeting. She gave us a delightful talk about how she'd come to write this biography her lifelong love of Jane Austen's novels. And then I had the very great privilege of driving her back into the city to drop her at her hotel. I'd have liked to have taken a route via the airport or somewhere, just so that the drive could have continued on and on and on, because it was just so wonderful talking to Claire. Uh, she was at that time busy working on her biography of Samuel Pepys. So we had a wonderful discussion about Pepys, one of my favorite writers and she was really charming and delightful. And her book is so clearly and elegantly written. I think as a woman, she brought to bear her, her feminist interests on Jane Austen's life, describes the difference when it comes to the Austen parents' treatment of daughters and sons, how Jane Austen might have felt about all of that, growing up a girl in this big family of, of mainly boys, out of course, from her sister. So it is a truly fabulous biography and one that I consult often and strongly recommend that you read if you have not done so already. Then there was a book called Becoming Jane, which led to a movie, but don't judge the book by Becoming Jane Austen. Don't judge the book by the movie Becoming Jane, which was a very pleasant and watchable film, but uh, full of things that certainly never happened in Jane Austen's actual life. I have a very personal interest in this book because John Spence was one of my very dearest friends. Our friendship started one day when the phone went and this very deep, very Southern American voice uh, said, asked if, if he was speaking to someone from the Jane Austen Society. John comes, or came from Georgia in the deep south of America. 
And uh, we got chatting and he said, well, I'm writing a book about Jane Austen and I'm interested in coming to the meetings of the Jane Austen Society. So I was so interested chatting to him, I, I rather cheekily suggested that we meet for a cup of coffee. In the end, we met for lunch in Double Bay. That lunch went on for so long, I almost forgot to pick up my children from school. John became, as I say, one of my very dearest friends. Uh, my husband, my children all loved John Spence. He was a truly wonderful man with an absolutely amazing sense of humour. So a very, very dear friend indeed. And I was absolutely devastated when we lost him quite some years ago now. But we would discuss very frequently what was going into his biography. And uh, he, when he very kindly uh, autographed the copy of the biography for me, uh, he wrote a, a really lovely inscription that I thought I would just share with all of you. He said, uh, for Susanna, who not only read endless drafts, but heard it all in incoherent, jabbering form, my very deepest gratitude and affection from John. And the book came out in the year 2003. Now, John was certain that uh, Jane Austen had fallen in love with Tom Lefroy. And so he uses that as a sort of, uh, uh, perhaps a sort of starting point in his biography to argue that really her feelings were very deeply involved and showing how the relationship with Tom Lefroy did influence particularly Pride and Prejudice. And he argues it wonderfully. Not everybody agrees with him. Uh, and of course, some people say she was never deeply in love with Tom Lefroy. It was just a flirtation. But it is a, a, a really fascinating and, of course, a beautifully written biography. I used to argue a lot with John about Emma. Uh, he was such a wonderful man, but he did have a fault. He didn't think as highly of Emma as he ought to have done. And so that, of course, led us into all sorts of arguments. And John would roll his eyes and say, oh, Susanna, what is it about this Emma that you so love? And the argument would continue. So I put in a picture of my very dear friend, John, here, so that you could also see him. Some of you I know will remember him coming to meetings. He was a very tall man, always stood out at meetings, often asked really interesting questions at the end of the talk, uh, and a very, very special man indeed. So I love his biography. Now, let me move on. Oh, sorry, this last one I meant to talk about as well. This is actually a novel. Uh, it just came out a few years ago. Uh, I've lost my paper that says when. Uh, written by Jill Hornby. And the Miss Austen of the title is not actually Jane, it's Cassandra. But I found this a very moving novel that talks particularly about Cassandra's uh, relationship with the, the family of her fiance, uh, Tom Fowl and the relationship between the sisters, showing that really Cassandra tried to do everything to protect and to nurture and foster the genius of her sister Jane. So while generally I'm not crazy about novels with Jane Austen in them, because I feel in so many cases the author doesn't get it right, this was one that I really felt worked and has had stellar reviews online uh, and uh, is, is really a very, very enjoyable book indeed. So definitely one that I can recommend if you want Jane Austen's life in the form of a novel. Now to move on to books about Jane Austen's world rather than particularly about the novels, although this one is sort of both. Uh, we, just a year ago now, lost Deirdre Le Fay, the finest Jane Austen scholar in the world. Jane Austen, uh, Deirdre knew more about Jane Austen's life than any other human being on this planet. I'm quite convinced that if you said, what was Jane Austen doing on the 10th of May in you know, seven, 1789, Deirdre would be able to tell you. Uh, I believe that all of her papers have gone, I think it's to the British Library. Um, could be wrong about that, but they're certainly being preserved in a library somewhere. She had an amazing collection of, of documents and facts and books, and uh, she, she was a wonderful author. I once had the great privilege of taking Deirdre to lunch at the pump room in Bath. Seemed a very fine Jane Austenish sort of place to go to. She was a formidable woman, 
You didn't want to make mistakes in your books because Deirdre would point them out to you. Uh, one poor American man wrote a book about Jane Austen's life. Deirdre sent a letter to the Times where she listed something like 161 mistakes in his book. And I thought, oh, help, you know, imagine being an author and putting all that time and effort into a book and then having Deirdre point out all the places where you had got it wrong. But this is a really lovely book, Jane Austen's The World of Her Novels. Uh, it's a bit hard to show you on the screen, but it is very beautifully illustrated. It's got maps, it's got uh, pictures of houses that might have influenced her, fashion, all sorts of other things. It's a gorgeous, solid, fascinating book and one that uh, I think really every true Jane Knight ought to have on their shelves. Came out in the year 2002, uh, gives a sort of overview of the Jane Austen era. It has a section on each of the novels, looking at what might have inspired the, the action, the places, and things like that. It really is an absolutely fabulous book, which of course is what you expect from Deirdre Le Fay. She published many books, but this one is my favorite of her books. Uh, and I think, as I say, a book that really every Janeite ought to own on their shelf. Jane Austen and the Clergy is another really excellent book. Obviously, as you can tell from the title, focusing on the clergy characters in her fiction and also the clergyman that she knew in her life. Of course, her father, uh, her brothers, uh, so many of the people that Jane Austen knew were clergymen. We were lucky enough many years ago to have delightful Irene Collins and her husband, Rex come out to a weekend conference that we were holding in Canberra. And Rex was one of the most charming men I have ever met. And of course, he had great delight in going round to people at the conference and introducing himself, saying, well, I'm the real Mr. Collins. And anybody less like the Mr. Collins and Pride and Prejudice, you could hardly imagine. Uh, Irene uh, was a lifelong member of the Church of England. She, had a very, she was an historian. Uh, she had a wonderful understanding of the church during the time of Jane Austen's life. And that comes through very, very clearly in this book. And I just learned so much from it. And just to give you one tiny example, there's a moment uh, in Mansfield Park when uh, Jane Austen is talking about Mrs. Norris and Doc Grant. And she puts, I'm not quoting this exactly, but she has something like, uh, Mrs. Norris and Dr. Grant had never been good friends. Their acquaintance had begun in dilapidations, and it had got worse after that. Uh, so something along those lines. Now, the average reader today would read that, that sentence and think their acquaintance had begun in dilapidations. You know, what's she talking about? And the chances are you would just move on and not really think much more about it. But Irene Collins explains that dilapidations were the wear and tear on a parsonage house and a church. So when, after Mr. Norris has died, the parsonage is being passed on to the incoming clergyman, Dr. Grant, then the dilapidations or the wear and tear has to be discussed. Now we all know what Mrs. Norris is like on the subject of money. So she's going to be fighting very vigorously and saying, no, 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 this hasn't been damaged at all. So that one tiny little bit their acquaintance had begun with dil in dilapidations. Tells us so much about the whole relationship between Mrs. Norris and Dr. Grant. And I would never have really paused and thought properly about that uh, had I not read Irene Collins's really excellent book. So I strongly recommend Jane Austen and the Clergy. Maggie Lane is another person we've been lucky enough to have in Australia. She too came to talk at a Canberra conference. And Maggie has written many excellent books. She told me that one day she was wanting to find out something about Jane Austen's family. And she looked in all sorts of books and couldn't find the answer to her question. And eventually she thought, well, maybe I'll try writing the book myself because I want to know the answer. So she wrote Jane Austen's Family, and she has produced so many other books since then. Jane Austen's England, Jane Austen's Family, Growing Older with Jane Austen, Jane Austen's World, Jane Austen and Names, and 
many, many more. But I think her best book is Jane Austen and Food. She has a whole chapter on Emma. So that, of course, is a winner with me. And Emma is a novel rich with references to food. She looks at the serving rituals. She looks at hospitality with food, uh, menus, manners. What's the white soup that Mr. Bingley serves at the Netherfield Ball? Greedy characters who eat too much, like Dr. Grant. Uh, people like Mr. Woodhouse, who are so fussy and demanding with food. It's a truly wonderful book. And Maggie also, in a very interesting way, looks at the symbolism of food in Jane Austen. So when Jane Austen writes about the profuse number of mulberries growing at Colonel Brandon's house, what is all the symbolism behind that? And what should we be learning as we read those little descriptions? We know that Jane Austen was a writer who never wasted one single word. Every word is there for a reason. So when she mentions a particular type of food, we know she has done it with a purpose. And Maggie Lane's wonderful book, I think, really uh, shows us just what an utterly brilliant writer Jane Austen was with every detail within her fiction. So a marvellous book. And it was wonderful to welcome Maggie to Australia. I see her most times when I go to England. We get together somewhere for, for lunch and we catch up with each other. She's a delightful person. She's been an absolute stalwart of the English Jane Austen Society, uh, publishing their publications, serving on the committee. Uh, she's a fabulous person and she's done a huge amount to promote uh, the novels of Jane Austen. Maggie's good friend, and also a friend to me, is Hazel Jones, and Hazel has also been to one of our conferences. Uh, she's written a book called Jane Austen's Journeys, but my favourite of her books is Jane Austen and Marriage, which was published in the year 2009. So Hazel looks at marriages within Jane Austen's own family, uh, marriages within the novels, she draws on contemporary conduct manuals and diaries and letters to give us a real picture of the whole ritual of getting married in Jane Austen's day, the forming of the engagement, uh, the process of courtship, honeymoons. I've always been intrigued that Maria Bertram took her sister with her on honeymoon. So perhaps had I been marrying Mr. Rushworth, I'd have taken my entire family with me for relief from his company. Uh, she talks about the wedding ceremonies. Uh, she talks about the importance of separate rooms, especially when you've had your 14th baby, uh, and recommending separate rooms is a very good idea indeed. And she also looks at old maids and the position of women in society who were not married and, of course, often had a very difficult time of it. People like Miss Bates in Emma. So uh, really fascinating book by Hazel Jones. And uh, uh, again, a book that's very elegantly and simply written. Uh, she doesn't use lots of academic jargon. She just tells us the interesting facts and puts the novels into the context of the era so that I think we come to appreciate the novels much more because of reading books like Jane Austen and Marriage. Let me grab the next ones from my pile. Now, Jane Austen gets translated into other languages. We are all lucky enough to be able to read the books in the language in which they were written. But that is certainly not the case for everybody. And one of the most interesting talks that we have ever had at a JASA meeting was given by a German professor who was living in Melbourne called Dr. Christian Graver. And he spoke to us about the challenges of translating Jane Austen's language into another language. And it was a riveting talk, absolutely fascinating. He talked about even just the first sentence of, uh, of Pride and Prejudice. This is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Well, what happens when you try to put that sentence into German, he asked. Now, of course, in German, the verb has to go to the end of the sentence. And Jane Austen, in that sentence, builds up the sense of, of Climax, you know, the single man, the good fortune, must be in want of a wife, is the final word and punch of the whole sentence. 
And of course, if you stick the verb at the end of the sentence, it loses its punch altogether. So this book uh, by a woman called um, Marie Negregotten Sorbo, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but you can see her in the picture. Mari was actually going to be coming to the conference we were supposed to be holding last year on International Jane Austen. That, of course, was not a good choice of conference theme in the year that COVID struck the world. But I just love reading this book about the various translators in Scandinavia, or Norway in particular, who have translated Jane Austen's novels. And what Māori does is to give examples of their translations, but she translates them back into English. So you can see the changes that have been made, the odd choices of words that have been sometimes selected. Uh, she, co she compares two novels. She's looking at Pride and Prejudice and Persuasion, but six different translations. And she shows how most of them have failed to capture the irony, the nuances, uh, some have, have made very extraordinary changes, and you think, well, why? What on earth is the rhyme or reason to that? And when you learn that Jane Austen has really not been popular in Scandinavia until very, very recently, uh, the 1995 Pride and Prejudice helped that, but before that, the, most Europeans felt Jane Austen was a waste of space. They couldn't see what anyone was raving about. And when you see what sorts of translations people were getting in Europe, you think it's hardly surprising that her books were not popular. So writers like Dickens, I think, were translated much better from the very beginning and therefore gained much greater popularity in Europe. The big problem with this book was its cost. It was one of those academic presses and it was something like $170 to buy a copy. I can't remember the exact figure, but it was truly hideously expensive. Uh, and I'm not sure we even have a copy in the Jazza Library. But I found this a really fascinating book, and it made me really think about what happens to Jane Austen when you translate the novels and how much is lost. If you just think of the, the courtship riddle in Emma, how on earth does a translator deal with that when the equivalent word in another language can't be split up into court, ship, and then courtship? So this was an excellent book, and I can't recommend it too highly. Okay, I'm now moving into, oh, there you can see the, some of the Norwegian translations uh, of, of uh, Pride and Prejudice. And I think the very... Um, pre-Raphaelite lady on the cover of Elizabeth tells you quite a lot about the, uh, the, the quality of the book in translation. I'm now moving on to looking at sort of critical books about Jane Austen, so people who have actually commented on the novels themselves. And these two authors are Sheila K. Smith, who lived from 1887 to 1956, and G.B. Stern, the G.B. stood for Gladys Bronwyn, and she lived from 1890 to 1973. And as you can see, these, these are cigarette cards, which tells you that these were very popular novelists in their day. Uh, so people were obviously enjoying reading the many books. They were both prolific writers, and they were definitely popular in their day, although I think almost never heard of now. Now, they ended up writing uh, two books, Talking of Jane Austen, which came out in 1943, and More Talk of Jane Austen, which came out in 1949. And I feel when I'm reading these books that it's like sitting down with a good friend. Now, I could be sitting with my very dear friend, Amanda Jones, and holding a conversation about Jane Austen's characters and themes. So it's almost like a sort of argument between the two women. They will quite frequently disagree on things, but they'll discuss and they will look more closely at the world of the novels and try to analyze why it is that they so love the books of Jane Austen. So you can tell by the fact that there was a sequel, that the first one was very popular, did well. You can still find it quite easily in secondhand bookshops, and I'm sure we do have a copy of certainly of the first one in the library, uh, so you will be able to borrow it from the library. 
They discuss the clergy of the day, housekeeping, education, and they even add a quiz at the end of one of those two volumes. So you can test your knowledge of Jane Austen with a little quiz. So very entertaining and very pleasant reading that makes you think about your own views of the characters in Jane Austen's novels. This is one that uh, one of the earlier critical books that I read, uh, a bit hard to find these days, although I do think we also have this one in the library, uh, Some Words of Jane Austen by Stuart M. Cave. Now, this book came out in 1973. Stuart Tave is an American academic. And when I looked him up online, I found he is currently 98 years of age. So still going strong. Uh, and I hope still reading and loving Van Austen. What Stuart Tave does in this book is to sort of capture the, use, use the uh, using language to capture the meaning and the definition of Jane Austen's world. So a look at the way she repeats certain words within her books, and he analyzes how she's sort of using those words and what it's saying about particular people. And just to give you one example, the use of the word elegant in Emma is first applied to Jane Fairfax. And Emma notes that Jane Fairfax is indeed a very elegant woman. But once Mrs. Austen starts, uh, sorry, Mrs. Elton starts using the word elegant, uh, then the Emma immediately gives it up. She no longer wants to use the word because the dreaded Mrs. Elton has used it. So he sort of traces the, the path of words throughout her fiction in a very clever and I think a very fascinating way indeed. He examines Jane Austen's language of moral concepts and values and sort of traces the force and function of words within her novels. So another really excellent book that you can sometimes find in secondhand bookshops, or I know the Jane Austen Bookshop in America will always be able to get you a copy of that one. I couldn't find a picture of the author of this book, Roger Sales. I did a bit of searching and I found lots of other Rogers, but not the right one. Uh, this book, Jane Austen and Representations of Regency England, was published in 1994. Now, you'll find amongst the uneducated a very common perception that, oh, Jane Austen completely ignored what was happening around her. You know, the Napoleonic Wars were going on and she barely mentions them and she never mentions, you know, all the other political things that were happening in her era. Well, those of us who've read Jane Austen know better. It's complete bunkum. She does pick up in so many interesting ways on what was happening politically, socially, uh, in the church, in the education system, the government, and of course the wars uh, within her fiction. And this book I think shows very clearly indeed how she does that. I particularly enjoyed his chapter on Mansfield Park when he shows that really there's a representation of the Regency crisis in this novel. Sir Thomas Bertram goes off to Antigua and he leaves his eldest son in charge and things all start to go wrong. Now, of course, the king had gone mad. He had been sort of shut away in Windsor Castle and his eldest son was in charge of the country and quite a lot was going wrong. And Roger Sales draws really interesting parallels between what was actually happening with the Regency crisis and with the monarchy and what is happening within Mansfield Park. He looks at all sorts of interesting aspects of Regency society and shows how Jane Austen reflects them in the fiction. Politics, the uh, idea of the dandy, you know, this was of course the era of Beau Brummel and the dandy Prince Regent. Uh, theatre and theatrical scandals, and of course we know how well they are represented in Mansfield Park. The importance and the rise of watering places and what that was doing to the tourist economy, and war also gets mentioned. So I think uh, Roger Sales does a wonderful job of really making us aware of what an utterly brilliant writer Jane Austen was at capturing what was going on in her country as she was sitting writing her novels. So uh, definitely a book that I can recommend. And this is a lovely book by Richard Jenkins, who is actually a descendant of one of Jane Austen's brothers. 
uh, and has been very much involved with the Jane Austen Society in the UK. It's a little elegant, slim volume, a fine brush on ivory, which is, of course, a quote from Jane Austen about her own work, uh, little miniature portraits with her fine brush on ivory, and beautifully written book. Uh, I think Richard Jenkins is particularly good in his chapter called The Prisoner at Hartfield. Uh, we often, when we first read Emma, we think Mr. Woodhouse is a dear old fellow and, you know, quite everybody likes him and he's a gentle sort of chap and a bit dotty on the subject of gruel and going for walks, but uh, otherwise he's fine. But I think Richard Jenkins's chapter made me really think of Mr. Woodhouse differently as being in many ways a, a tyrannical father and the damage that he does to Emma uh, and the way in which she is imprisoned within, within the, the home, really, in many ways. Uh, he was very illuminating on that, and, and I just loved this book. Again, very elegantly written, shows a deep reading of the novels, uh, and a, an absolute delight. A, a little volume, I wanted it to be longer. I was sad when it ended, but a really fabulous book in, in my view. So uh, again, definitely one that I can recommend. And this is the book that where I start to show a little bit of envy, in fact, more than a little bit. If I could have written one book about Jane Austen, I'd like it to be this one. I am so envious that John Mullen was able to write this, and I love every single page of this book. Uh, John Mullen, an English academic, uh, this book was published in the year 2012, and it has sold very well indeed. Uh, he appeared on the television program sort of, that was, um, what was it called, the sort of quantum debate or something, uh, where it was being debated whether Pride and Prejudice, <coughs> excuse me, whether Pride and Prejudice was a greater novel than Wuthering Heights. And John Mullen was the, uh, the speaker in, in favor of, of Pride and Prejudice, and on the whole did a very good job. But this book is just so fabulous. He picks up on many, many details of the novels and examines things. He looks at who dies, who manages to have sex, uh, the risks of going to the seaside, which characters never speak. It's a wonderful chapter. Uh, characters like, uh, you know, Mr. Perry, the apothecary in Emma, we only ever get his speech reflected back to us via Mr. Woodhouse. He never actually has a direct line of speech in the novel. And there are many other characters who are quoted and talked about, but who never are actually allowed to say a single thing for themselves. So that was a wonderful section, it was one of the, the 20 puzzles. Um, how much money is enough money? Uh, every single page of this book was a total delight. And I have to say, you can't really be a proper Janeite if you don't own this book. Uh, it's, as I say, the book I wish I could have written about Jane Austen. It is just so marvelous. I loved every single thing about this book. And I hope that John Mullen writes a lot more about Jane Austen because he does it so brilliantly. So let me on here. More critical works or sort of more, uh, in this case, more looking at Jane Austen's textual history. What happens to the texts of her novels and mistakes that get made and carried on from one edition to the next? Uh, this is a really fascinating book by the Oxford academic Catherine Sutherland. She's the Professor of Bibliographical and Textual Criticism, so she really knows what she's talking about. And the book is a very academic one. It was published by the Oxford University Press, and it looks at how Jane Austen was sort of transmitted and transformed through manuscripts, critical editions, biographies, and adaptations. So it's packed with information. It's not a light read, but it certainly is a very fascinating one. How, for example, did the Oxford University Press shape Jane Austen's reputation when they brought out the sort of proper authoritative um, annotated editions of the novels? How did Jane Austen reach her canonical position that she holds today? This is what Catherine Sutherland is looking at in her book and she does it really in a most fascinating way. 
Uh, so a book that came out in, in 2005 uh, was, has been very, very highly praised by critics ever since and a really excellent book, uh, which makes you think about you know, critical editions, manuscripts, mistakes that creep in. You know, how does an author eventually become, you know, almost saint-like in the canon of English literature? And Catherine Sutherland explains that very well. Now, this next book, Jane's Fame, which has the most wonderful subtitle, How Austen Conquered the World. Well, isn't that great? We, we know she's conquered the world, uh, but uh, it's, it's such a great subtitle. Uh, this is by Claire Harmon. And Claire Harmon was evidently, and I think I've got this right, uh, a, a student of Catherine Sutherland at Oxford. And she knew, of course, about Catherine Sutherland's book, and she decided to do something very similar, except that she made it far less academic. The, the language was perhaps more user-friendly. The cover was much more likely to catch the, uh, the public's imagination, as was the title of the book, Jane's Fame, sounds a lot more appear appealing than Jane Austen's textual lives. So this evidently caused a huge falling out between the two women, because Catherine Sutherland was very unhappy that Claire Harmon had sort of jumped onto her patch, and Jane's fame sold in much, much greater quantities than did Catherine Sutherland's book. It was cheaper, it was a paperback, it was sort of more appealing to the general public. But I love Claire Harmon as a writer. Uh, she's done a wonderful book on Fanny Burney. She's done one on Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, she is an excellent writer. I love her style. And I thoroughly enjoyed Jane's fame. And again, she sort of shows the story of Jane Austen's rise to the position in which she sits very comfortably today. Uh, and I just wanted to read the quote on the this is from uh, a letter from Joseph Conrad to H.G. Wells, where Joseph Conrad writes, what is all this about Jane Austen? What is there in her? What is it all about? Joseph Conrad, who of course was Polish originally, then learned to speak French, then learned to speak English and wrote in English, just could not understand what it was about Jane Austen that was so appealing. And so Claire Harmon sort of uses that as a starting point to show what it is about Jane Austen that has made her so incredibly famous. And uh, the picture that you see on the cover, interestingly, is known as the wedding ring portrait. Uh, it was the sort of pretty up portrait of the sort of version that uh, Sandra did of Jane, but all very pretty up. And at some stage in the history of this portrait, a wedding ring got added to Jane Austen's hand. You can see it there in the picture. Totally inaccurate, but all part of the sort of the Jane Austen image that people were wanting to promote. So I think this is, a, again, a very readable, extremely enjoyable book. I don't know if the uh, feud between the two authors has ever been sorted out, but uh, it is a delightful book and one that I can very definitely recommend. So that has brought me pretty much to the end of my selection of different books about Jane Austen. Oh, sorry, I've got one more. We were today going to be having Janine Barkas coming to talk to us. And Janine brought out just uh, in 2020 her superb book, The Lost Books of Jane Austen. I've been arranging this as a gift for many different people uh, since it came out. I think it is such a marvellous book. And what Janine does in this book is something I think that's truly groundbreaking. Now, for a very long time, there has been this belief that Jane Austen was moderately popular when first published. And then around the time that she died, her book sort of disappeared from view. And it was only much later, in the, uh, much later in the Victorian era, towards the end of the century, when her nephew wrote that memoir that I showed you earlier, that suddenly Jane Austen's books came back into popularity. And then as time went on, there were 1940s film versions and gradually her fame grew and grew. Well, what Janine does in this book is show that really that's not the case at all. Jane Austen's books, flourished throughout the Victorian era, 
often in very cheap paperback editions, which uh, tend to be the books that don't survive because they're cheap and, and you know, they fall to bits fairly easily. But she really shows that uh, uh, there were all these different inexpensive editions. And she shows wonderfully, I think, uh, how Jane Austen was used and copies of the books were produced as special Sunday school prizes or even to advertise different products. Uh, there was also this amazing craze for what Janine calls thinking Jane Austen. And this helped to persuade people that Jane Austen was a writer for girls and not for males. And I think in many ways did an enormous amount of harm. Uh, a young boy is not terribly likely to buy any of these editions of Jane Austen with all that pink on the cover. They tend to think, oh no, she's a, she's a writer for girls, not for boys. So Janine's got a fascinating chapter about the pinking of Jane Austen in different editions and how that in the end uh, helped to drive a lot of men away from reading Jane Austen, which of course is a terrible thing to have happen. What Janine also does in her book is provide wonderful little snapshots of the owners of some of the old editions that she found. She's gone back to find out more about the person whose name was written on the front. Uh, and that is, you know, these wonderful little sort of potted histories within the book of the different owners uh, at various times through the Victorian era of certain editions of Jane Austen. So just to go back and show you that cover, the Lost Books of Jane Austen is eye-opening, utterly fascinating from beginning to end, beautifully written by Janine. And I'm really sorry that she's stuck in Oakuni without access to Wi-Fi, and she couldn't today be giving us a talk about this truly fabulous book. So there are the pink editions again. And now I will bring this talk to something of a close, but of course we'd like to receive questions and comments and you may all also have uh, ed editions that you would like to show. I've always loved this little story. The Oxford philosopher Gilbert Ryle was once asked if he ever read novels and he replied, oh yes, all six, every year. And People don't even need to say, well, who wrote the six? We all just know that all six, yes, it means Jane Austen every year. And for Gilbert Ryle, he needed no other novels because there is so much within those books to read, to enjoy, and to learn from. And I think that I can agree with Gilbert Ryle that Jane Austen too is my philosophy. I have learned so much from her fiction. Now, I'm very aware in this talk that I have left out many wonderful books, not least all the many fabulous books that have been written by members of the great Jane Austen Society of Australia. I felt I might be venturing into murky territory if I mentioned some of them and not all of them. And so in the end, I thought, no, I'm best to just sort of leave that area and just mention the fact that we've had so many fantastic books about Jane Austen by members of our society. Judy Stove, Michael Giffen, Penny Gay, Jocelyn Harris, Yasmin Gunaratni, John Wiltshire, and Jennifer Kloster are just some of the Jazza authors who have contributed to the fabulous scholarship about Jane Austen. Now it has been said that a great book is one that has never finished saying what it has to say. Jane Austen, as we know, wrote six great novels. And there's absolutely no sign that people have come anywhere close to saying all that can be said about the riches, the depths, and the utter brilliance of those six novels. So I hope you have enjoyed my sharing of some favorite books about Jane Austen. Uh, I loved going to my bookcase, looking at all the different things, and oh, do I talk about that one or shall I choose that one? It wasn't easy to make the decisions, but uh, I've given you a little bit of a run through of some of the treasures on my Jane Austen bookshelf. And I hope, what I really hope I have done is encourage all of you to go away and do more reading about Jane Austen, because it's only that reading that will make you come to utterly appreciate the genius, the sheer brilliance and 
marvelousness of the novels of Jane Austen. So more reading, more learning, and then more appreciation and more enjoyment. Nobody at the moment can argue they don't have time because uh, of COVID. If you do want to get some of them, of course, you can borrow them by post from the Jazza Library. So do remember to make use of the wonderful collection that uh, Sibylla has in our library at the moment and do more reading, not only of Jane Austen, but about Jane Austen. Thanks very much, everyone.